Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nadia Burton. I'm the Associate Dean, Undergraduate Studies, Students and Pedagogy in the Faculty of Community Services. It's my pleasure to be with, here with you today and to welcome you to the first event in a series of six panel discussions in the Sex and the Pandemic Speaker Series. Uh, I'm going to begin with a land acknowledgement. As we gather today to listen to speakers share their thinking, to reflect on and learn from their perspectives, and to engage in critical discussion, we acknowledge that Ryerson University is on Treaty 13 territory, a treaty that was established between the Mississauga of the Credit River and the Fish Mount. We're surrounded by Treaty 13A, Treaty 20, which is also known as Williams Treaty, and Treaty 19. Although I imagine not everyone here today is necessarily connected to this university, and perhaps many here do not even call Toronto home, both Toronto and the university are in the dish with one spoon territory, which is a treaty between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabek, including allied nations, to peaceably share and protect the resources around the Great Lakes. As always, the purpose of land acknowledgement is to help us pause and recognize the territory we are on. So if you find yourself somewhere other than Toronto right now, I hope you're able to acknowledge where you are, to acknowledge both the history and present of Indigenous community in the place you call home. While those of us who are not Indigenous have arrived as settlers on Indigenous territory in different ways, and we acknowledge that some of our ancestors and elders were forcibly displaced people brought here involuntarily or by force, particularly those brought here as a result of the transatlantic slave trade, we acknowledge that we are all treaty people and we're grateful to be working and to be living on this land. I won't take much time in introducing. We have two fantastic speakers to hear from today. I do wanna thank Dr. Ricky Varghese for inviting me to offer this opening and to warmly welcome everyone, today's speakers and participants to this first panel discussion, A Tale of Two Viruses, in what looks to be a fantastic six part series, taking up how our understandings of sex and sexualities continue to shift and evolve. Nadia, Nadia, please slow down a little bit. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry in the context of this current story, how our, how our understandings of sex and sexuality continue to shift and evolve in the context. Organized as one component of Dr. Varghese's Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada Connection Grant, these talks provide a platform for critical reflection and dialogue amongst academics, students, activists, artists, service providers, bringing diverse perspectives and experiences to bear on the topic. Dr. Varghese holds the Tanis Doe Postdoctoral Fellowship in Gender, Disability and Social Justice in the School of Disability Studies. And as many of you know, Disability Studies is one school within the Faculty of Community Services at this university. While our schools are diverse, they vary from midwifery to urban planning, just to give you a sense. Our faculty and the schools housed, housed within it share some important and valuable commitments. These are to community engagement, education that takes students as often as possible outside the walls of the academy to learn in community, the work of justice, for and alongside the most vulnerable in our society and our communities to make the world a kinder and more equitable place and to engaging in meaningful, rigorous, critical dialogue about the issues of our time. This speaker series exemplifies many of these commitments, bringing together scholars from a range of disciplinary backgrounds and investments, including sociology, media studies, disability studies, queer theory, analysis, and both studies to explore and engage thinking about in the time of pandemic. The two speakers today are gonna to talk about viruses, AIDS and COVID, and from different perspectives that are the very stuff of political and theoretical engagement. Wading through what is enabled and what is limited when we bring these two viruses into the same conceptual space and reflecting on the way the violence of these viruses is enacted against Black lives, they are asked with some urgency think about the current moment in which we find ourselves in ways we might not always be want to do. These critical engagements are, I would argue, necessary, challenging, 
sometimes painful, and always meaningful. So much gratitude to our two speakers for the thinking that they'll be sharing with us today. I know that today's talks will engage and challenge and stretch us, and what a wonderful gift this is. Thank you again, Dr. Varghese, for inviting me to welcome everyone on behalf of the Faculty of Community Services Dean's Office. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for that lovely, lovely note of love and, and for providing the land that knows in that year and for being here and being part of inaugurating this speaker series. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to this first panel of the Sex and the Pandemic series on this sunny, hot Friday afternoon. It's great to be here with you, and I'm super excited to be bringing this series to you over the next six months. As Martin mentioned, my name is Lady Louise, and I am an Anderson Postdoctoral Fellow in Gender, Disability, and Social Justice here at the School of Disability Studies, which is housed in the Faculty of Community Services. As of last week, I have been at Ryerson for a whole year as part of the studio fellowship. It's been a long and a year, to say at least. It feels that so much has transpired over our lives, both individually and collectively. Uh, and um, a lot of our lives have been changed as a result of this pandemic. So the promise of the vaccines it provides us that some comfort, a ripple effect of this invasion will be felt on so many different levels for years to come. I want to start my remarks with a short personal anecdote in my own experience of the pandemic. While the first cases of the pandemic began to be reported in Wuhan in December 2019, the WHO declared the invasion of pandemic on March 11th, 2020. That date, March 11th, 2020, happened to also be, incidentally, the day I was offered this research fellowship at Ryerson. And to drop it all off, coincidentally, the next day, March 12th, happened to be my birthday, or happens to be my birthday. For the rest of my life, I'll be in of the deeply personal and implicit length of these events. I officially started my fellowship at Ryerson on May 11, 2020. The original plan was to use my time here to work on a book that had been swimming around in my mind, put it occupying me for a few years now. A book about suicide, sexual difference and that life. The more I thought about it, the more I realized how wildly uncanny this idea felt. Writing a book about suicide in the midst of the global pandemic, with a sense of the death life seems to be set at an all-time high. In a way, I had always been preoccupied with the death line, even in my earlier work. In the past, written extensively about the AIDS crisis, about sex, sexuality, and about their backing, otherwise known as sex without condoms. So the end of the deadline as the pandemic was raging on felt like an strangely natural progression. From the very outset of the pandemic, I became privy to a series of conversations primarily had by clear identified men, comparing and contrasting the current pandemic with the AIDS crisis. While initially these conversations felt epidemiological in nature, the closer I looked, the more I realized that they were about infected people. They were about the historical drama of the AIDS crisis about the memory of loss, about the fear of becoming ill, about the loss of community, loved ones, and perhaps about all else, 
about anything sexual or otherwise that would entirely be reconstituted as a result of this pandemic. The anxiety was palpable as the cornfields of how each one of us would experience intimacy henceforth was being redrawn and reimagined yet again. I wanted to take this comparative conversation without HIV and COVID-19 seriously, not so much because I believe the comparisons between the viruses were accurate, but rather because the conversations were happening and the energy informed so much of public and private discourse. The earlier idea of the deadline that so informs a lot of my Indian research, there is a common misconception that it arises about that or the desires of that. In fact, the deadline without going into a long theoretical discussion about it is actually about life, about learning how to live finally as the famous French philosopher Derrida suggested once, by learning what it might mean to die or enter our mortality, especially in the face of a devastating contagion. This way in which the death line informs life and is fundamentally about living rather than dying is so exemplified in what clear art historian Douglas Quint said, in the arts to the AIDS crisis. In his now canonical 1987 essay, How to Help Promiscuity in an Epidemic, Douglas Prince set the stage for a rather frank and open discussion about what it meant to sustain a sex life, let alone sexuality, during a dramatic invasion. This is what he had to say. Our promiscuity taught us many things, not only about the pleasures of sex, but about the great multiplicity of our pleasures. It is that psychic preparation, that experimentation, that conscious work of on our own sexualities that has allowed many of us to change our sexual behaviors. They insist that our promiscuity will destroy us, when in fact it is our promiscuity that will save us. Imagine that, the death line or what it leaves open to in terms of preparation and explanation may actually be what saves us. It is with these thoughts in mind that I love the new law in this series and this first panel, and I hope that you will find the ensuing conversation of what it is insightful and pushes us to think collectively and clearly. A bit about how the afternoon will proceed. After both the speakers had given their thoughts, I will initiate a, a discussion between the three of us to get started. After that, we'll open the floor for questions and comments from the audience. Alex and Yosti will field the questions and present them to the panelists. She will now give a few words about how you can ask questions or provide your comments during the discussion portion of the afternoon. Ellie? Hi, everyone. Um, so just first off, uh, if you'd like to see uh, the live captions as they are being uh, made today, please click, click the CC button that's down below. Um, and so there are a few ways for you to participate in today's panel. Um, first, feel free to use the chat box to ask questions directly to panelists and to chat with your fellow attendees. But please note that um, the chat box is automatically set to send messages only to panelists. So if you'd like to see everyone to see your remarks, please click the arrow next to the button and click all panelists and attendees before you send your text. Um, if in the Q&A portion of the panel, you would like to speak out loud, uh, please press the raise hand button and we can enable your microphone at the appropriate time. Uh, also, Zoom webinars have a question and answer feature. To use this feature, press the question and answer button, type your question into the Q&A box and click send. You can also choose to send this question anonymously by checking that box below the typing area. 
we can reply to these questions live um, or via text within this window. Uh, I believe as an attendee, you can also like other attendees questions. So if you see another question that someone asked and you'd like to see it answered, just click the thumbs up button below that question. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Ali, um, for that. And now without a further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker, uh, Ronaldo Lockhart. Um, I've known Ronaldo for almost two decades now. Uh, it's uh, uh, a very long time. <laughs> um, Ronaldo Lockhart is a professor at the Women's Center Studies Institute at the University of Toronto. Um, he was also my PhD supervisor, so um, I've had the pleasure of working with him. Um, he is the author of two books that have come out this year. Um, one of which is On Property by the Diosis, and the other is A Long Emancipation, Moving Towards Black Freedom, which just came out uh, a few weeks ago. His research and teaching is in the area of Black diaspora cultural studies. And now I will offer the floor to the novel. First, let me begin by thanking you, Ricky, for inviting me to participate in this important set of conversations um, at the School of Disability Studies. So I'd like to thank the School of Disability Studies as well. Um, I'd like to thank Nadia Burton for the opening comments and Talia Chernowski um, for getting us organized and of course, Loop Nature, the tech person. And last but not least, because I'm making their job a little bit difficult, the ASL translators whom I apologize in advance. And I know I can sometimes speak quickly, so I'm going to be, if I seem st really stilted, it's because I'm trying to speak slowly, not to make their work any more difficult than I already have. So the paper that I'm going to speak to is a paper called Open to Infection, Viruses and Black Sex Life. This paper began as um, a paper on HIV AIDS that is co-written by Dr. Idil Abdullahi and myself. And what I have done is I've taken some of the ideas from that paper and joined it to um, another paper that I had been, that's partly published, but it will be different as well, um, that came out in Topia, Mag um, Topia Journal on the conjuncture of COVID. I wanna say a couple things about HIV AIDS and black people, in particular black gay men. So when you hear me say black, I'm really talking about black gay men. And I wanna be clear about that, even though I think that some of what I say extends beyond that population. In my work, I keep coming back to the question of whether or not a virus can be racist. And what I've tried to do in answering that question is to really think about the social life of a virus. And I borrow that idea of the social life of a virus from Alondra Nelson and the work that she has done on DNA and the way in which DNA has now come to be at the heart of all of the important issues of our time. Of course, HIV, AIDS, and now COVID are at the heart of all of the important issues of our time as well, and particularly for Black people. One of the ways in which I attempt to make sense of how HIV, 
and COVID sit at the heart of Black life is to always return to the history of HIV, which is the history of Haiti, the history of Africa, and the history of a kind of public health and epidemiological knowledge that located the virus of HIV initially among Haitians and then in Africa. And it would appear that the history of this virus as, as, as having generated itself in Africa is now a settled history. At least a settled part of the, the history of science of the virus. But what is not settled and what continues to remain is the sense, a certain sense of a logic of hygiene, a logic of pollution, a logic of um, a logic of black people that's always fundamentally infected and bringing infection that shapes HIV, and I would argue will most likely shape COVID. So I know that in the moment of COVID, many scholars of AIDS and HIV, particularly I'm thinking of the work of the social historian and activist, um, Gary Kingsman, um, have been making the case that there's much that we learned from the early days of organizing around AIDS that we can learn from organizing around this pandemic. And I do think that there are some similarities. And I think that those similarities live in the social life of the two viruses. And I think that those similarities live in what will be the experience of black life from the two viruses. But I think that there are also some really important differences. HIV AIDS cannot leave behind the history of its deep association with the dirty, polluted, ass fucking, come drinking sex of gay people. COVID does not have that kind of history, even though it will come to settle in among the kinds of populations that are supposed to have the kind of history that produce AIDS in the first instance that I just mentioned. So COVID and AIDS meet at a particular conjuncture. And that conjuncture is in the bodies of non-white people, but, but in particular for my interest, in the bodies of black people. So this is what Stuart Hall would call a conjunctural moment. How these two viruses and the social lives of these viruses converge on the bodies of black people. And of course, last year at this time, May 2020, black people, their allies and many others took to the streets by the hundreds of thousands when images of a police, a white policeman publicly lynching George Floyd emerged as many of us were isolating in our homes. One of the things that I continue to think about is that not only did we witness the public lynching, the very public lynching of George Floyd, but that George Floyd had apparently also been diagnosed earlier and had contracted um, COVID. And one of the things that I'm trying to do in thinking about um, this conjuncture uh, at the moment of these viruses, uh, police violence, black bodies, and black life is to think about the relationship between labor abandonment and the racist, sexist, or what Himani Banjo would call the racist sexism of the labor market. 
where Black women and other women of color find themselves engaged in forms of labor that expose them to the COVID virus, a virus that they then return to their families. And, and, in, and in many instances in North America, I mean in the US, Canada, and in Europe, in particularly the UK, it has been Black, South Asian, and other people of color who have died at large numbers from COVID. Not unlike the fact that HIV AIDS continues to be an epidemic for non-white communities, especially Black men. So the social life of these, of these viruses is in many ways also a violence of infection. Infection itself is a form of violence. The third point that I wanna make, cause those were two points that I just made. The third point I wanna make is a point about how then we respond to these questions concerning, you know, the conjuncture of labor, of abandonment, um, of exclusion, all of the ways in which black life gets marked as a life not really worthy of life. And of course, in the field of HIV, syndemics has been the language news to make sense of all of the social forces that might impact um, a particular, that might impact how one lives with HIV. Now, anyone who reads carefully the language of syndemics and the literature of syndemics, you would know that syndemics comes to mark really, that, sorry, let me put it this way. Syndemics is by default, a language that comes to mark the life of white gay men. So a syndemic analysis will list all of the kinds of um, categories or elements that um, will impact one's life, a person living with HIV. And among the list of those elements would be anti-Black racism. And of course, from my vantage point, Anti-Black racism is not simply one element among others for Black gay men, but rather it is the foundational element that shapes all of the other elements. And this is why understanding the social life of these viruses as a convergence between the biological and the social is crucially important for making sense of how these viruses play themselves out beyond the epidemiology, beyond um, the virology, that these viruses live longer among um, Black people and Black communities because of the strength of their social lives, already embedded in that history of Black bodies as always unhygienic, always already polluted, and so on. I invoke syndemics because I think it's really important that as we begin to see the extended social life of COVID-19 in Black communities and therefore among Black gay men, that we will be able to make sense of the compounded nature of how a virus moves from solely a biological entity into a social entity. And that in fact, it is at the site of the social entity that the virus continues to do its most significant damage. And in the moment of COVID, a number of, of epidemiologists and others turn to syndemics again as yet another example of how to make sense of COVID's impact on largely non-white communities. And again, I caution around this because I think that syndemics as Abdullahi and I argue in, in the other paper that's only on AIDS, that syndemics is a kind of intersectionality light, meaning that the, the things, the elements that syndemics claims that it wants to cover that we already previously had language from black feminists 
that allowed us to cover those elements. So in some ways, synthemics works to cover up rather than to expose. The fourth point I want to make then um, is going to take me into this kind of question of Black sex life. From about the 2000s onwards, Black men and sex and death became linked. The CDC out of the US um, put out a number of reports in the early 2000s and well into the mid 2000s that made the case for linking Black men and sex and death through HIV as one. In, in fact, in the earlier work that I wrote about this um, that Ricky edited, and, and I used the phrase, if you have sex with a Black man, if you fuck a Black man, you will die. That was made very clear um, by the CD, CDC messaging. And that kind of logic um, didn't just stay within the borders of the USA, but that kind of logic extended into public health practices in Canada, the UK, and any place where there are large populations of Black people and where the HIV epidemic continues to reign. And so this kind of question then of how we think about Black sex life in the convergence of two viruses, one that is heavily circumscribed by the practice of sexuality and another that is not, is important to make a clear distinction between. And yet here we get another convergence. We get a convergence at the site of criminality. So we know that Canada is one of the leading nations for HIV criminalization in that Black people play a significant role in that criminalization. And we increasingly see the criminalization of COVID. Again, what we're heading into is the question of how the social life of these viruses will continue to live much longer again, uh, among um, disadvantaged, excluded, racialized and now criminalized populations. So again, there's some convergences, but there's some really important differences that we have to hold on to. At the site of sex life and black self life, where HIV is criminalized, the question of hygiene, the question of pollution, the question of a certain kind of black degeneracy remains central. And all of this again can be returned to the original story of HIV AIDS and its relationship to Haitians and then Africans. And then the idea that the scientific knowledge is settled that HIV comes out of Africa. So this is my last point. And my last point really comes out of have, having made this, have, having Ricky having made this invitation to me and rethinking the work that Idil Abdullahi and I have been doing and the work that I've been trying to do on COVID. And the last point is this. The last point is that we need to develop a theory of the prophylactic, a social theory of the prophylactic. If in the initial moment of HIV, we came to understand the condom as not only important for extending the social lives of gay men, but the condom is also a political tool in extending the sex lives of gay men. We are now in urgent need of a similar kind of intervention but not at the level of the apparatus as the thing that we put on, as in the condom in the instance of, of gay men in that period, but rather the prophylactic 
as a kind of less necessary urgent political discourse. And I, I've come to this for two reasons. But actually, I've come to this for one reason, really, which is that about 35 to 40 years after the advent of HIV AIDS, in North America and in Black communities, we actually still know very little about how Black men fuck. We literally do not understand or have a significant body of literature on Black men's sex lives. Now, of course, the scholar Marlon Bailey is doing some of this work and doing some of this work at the ethnographic level and doing it quite interestingly and urgently. But I guess what I want to say to you is, in closing is, that both viruses return us to this problem, this historic white supremacist logic and problem of blackness and hygiene. And the kind of social unleashing of black people in both the Americas and Africa as fundamentally degenerate, polluted, and in need of a particular kind of repair. So the question of a black sex life at the convergence of two viruses and at the conjuncture of state abandonment is one that requires us to work towards a new theory of the perfilactic. Thank you. Excellent, Aldo. Um, that was very, very um, insightful. And um, I had lots of questions that I'd like to ask. And so the audience also has a lot of uh, thoughts. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that after our next speaker. Um, and I'm going to introduce the next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Ryan Conrad, who also I, I've known for quite some time. Uh, and uh, Ryan is a short postdoctoral fellow in the seminar and media studies uh, program at uh, York University, um, where he is working on a manuscript entitled uh, Radical Vision, um, Canadian AIDS Film and Video. He is also part and faculty in the Interdisciplinary Studies program, uh, in Sexuality program at Concordia University, and the Lenin and Gender Studies program at Harvard University. He previously held a postdoctoral fellow He served as the vice chair of the sexuality Association. So I'm let Ryan start. stop. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you to Ricky. Um, thank you, Talia, Nadia. Uh, Luke, the interpreters, Ronaldo, for giving us so much to think about already. Um, so I have a, a slide deck to share uh, for people who would like something visual to go along with the conversation. So I'm going to share my screen uh, and take you through uh, a conversation uh, about HIV and SARS-CoV-2. Um, so the title of my talk, uh, Distinct and Dissimilar, HIV, COVID-19, and the Desire for Meaning. Uh, I'll take you quickly on a, a roadmap uh, of, of what I'll do with my talk. Um, I, I will give a bit of context uh, for um, 
the, the ideas that I've come to and how I've come to them, I will spend some time talking about the epidemiological difference and the social cultural difference between SARS-CoV-2 and HIV. Uh, and then I want to think a bit about some of the comparative discourse um, that has come about between the comparison um, between AIDS and COVID-19 and HIV and SARS-CoV-2. I'll spend some time on that and then wrap it up thinking about um, lessons that can be learned from previous social movements. Um, so, um, to be radically honest, this is, this is the context where I'm thinking about these questions. Um, as a scholar, I've been actively resisting the demands to be hyperproductive. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, which is not always a choice that we can make when our productivity is tied to our income. Um, but I've also been resisting the, the sort of push to make work responding specifically to COVID-19. Um, so this, this uh, my participation today is um, uh, in contradiction to that uh, sort of space that I've been trying to hold. Um, and also resisting the impulse to revise or rethink current research through um, the COVID-19 lens. Uh, in particular, I was working on a film with a lover of mine about our serodiscordant relationship. Um, and we shot it in January, 2020. Um, and I haven't touched it since because I, I I don't want it to be about COVID or read through a COVID lens. Um, and so with this conversation, I'm, I'm sitting with a lot of ambivalence, uh, hesitancy, frustration, uh, and also annoyance, um, like annoyed that I have to explain to people that um, COVID-19 and the AIDS crisis aren't, aren't similar in most ways. Um, but I also want to acknowledge the um, significant changes since uh, Ricky asked me to participate uh, in this speaker series in October of 2020. And originally I said no, <laughs> uh, or I said I, I don't think I'm a good fit um, because I don't see the usefulness uh, in the comparison between HIV and AIDS and SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Um, so a lot has changed since October 2020. Uh, I think the comparisons have receded in, in a significant way. Um, so there's, there's that to contend with that I think, for me, this conversation feels less urgent than it did uh, in the fall when I was often responding to um, other scholars and people in my, um, in my world making the comparison. Uh, I also want to be clear about a lot of, like, I'm a junior scholar. I'm, I'm actually not any of the things that Ricky said. I am not employed. I'm unvaccinated. I don't have a vaccine appointment till the end of June. Um, I'm tired. I'm depressed. I feel manic. There's a lot of uncertainty and desperation in my life currently. Um, and so that's the conditions under which I've tried to make this presentation. <laughs> And, and make it make sense and, and to be useful. Uh, and lastly, um, as a junior scholar, I find it really hard to put energy into this when the world is literally on fire. Um, from the genocide in Palestine, uh, the new war on sex workers and migrant sex workers in Ontario, through bill number 251, the ongoing anti-Black and anti-Indigenous police violence that we see play out in the media all the time and in our lives. Um, and also today that my colleague and fellow union member uh, at Carleton uh, is actually on trial, was on trial today in Turkey and is probably going to spend the rest of his life in prison. Um, the climate catastrophe, ongoing COVID, 
things are really shitty. Um, and I just want to be uh, really upfront about that and that I'm not doing well. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to try to share something with you that's coherent and useful. So here we go. Uh, something that was really useful um, in the conversation that Ronaldo shared with us is thinking about the difference between the epidemiology of a virus and the social life of a virus. And I'm very much on the same page. Um, but I do actually think it's helpful to talk through the epidemiological differences because most people don't know anything about HIV. Um, so I'm going to quickly just go through some of those differences. Um, a major uh, difference is the, the, the response of the immune system to the virus SARS-CoV-2. Um, and not to put Nadia, uh, who introduced us on the hot seat, but AIDS is not a virus, right? Um, HIV is the virus. AIDS is the syndrome. So SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes the illness we call COVID-19. And HIV is the virus that we believe causes AIDS. This is important to, to be specific with our language and to be clear. Um, so SARS-CoV-2 causes an overreaction of the immune, immune system. So this is severe inflammation um, and also what we call a cytokine storm. Uh, so this is what COVID-19 is. So HIV remains largely undetected in the immune, by the immune system and HIV then attacks the immune system itself. Right, so it destroys the immune system. So it destroys the body's ability to defend itself. Um, so this is this is particularly very different epidemiologically how these two viruses work. Eighty to ninety percent of people clear SARS-CoV-2 from the body without treatment, while HIV cannot be cleared from the body even with treatment save a number of people you can count on one hand. In terms of treatment, vaccines were produced for SARS-CoV-2 in less than a year, and therapeutic medications have already been approved, particularly by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, I won't name them, but if anyone really wants to know them, I can share later. Um, so HIV remains incurable, there's no vaccine and safe, effective therapeutic antiretroviral medication took 15 years to develop. So again, thinking about what happens to the body, how much time it takes is very different between these two. Um, also a reminder in terms of mortality, People don't die from HIV, but from opportunistic infections that attack the body after HIV has deactivated the immune system. Whereas SARS-CoV-2 kills outright. COVID-19, the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2, primarily kills elderly people especially those living in congregate or group care. AIDS, pre-treatment, pre-protease inhibitors, primarily killed sexually active younger adults, particularly gay and bisexual men, people who use drugs and racialized people, particularly as Ronaldo has also noted, Patients. Again, in terms of mortality, about 20,000 people have died from AIDS in Canada over the last 40 years, while about 25,000 people have died from COVID-19 in just over a year in Canada. 
So again, very different timelines of the disease. SARS-CoV-2, the transmission is not tied to over-signified acts. And by over-signified acts, I'm talking about sex and particularly sex between men, as well as drug use. So an important epidemiological question for me is, what are the epistemological dangers present when we repeat COVID-19 is like the AIDS crisis? When we live in a country where young people receive no sex education or very little sex education. I teach two first year introduction to queer studies, theories of sexuality, and none of my students know what HIV or AIDS stand for, how it's transmitted, or anything about it more generally. So for me, my worst fear is that when young people or people who don't know history or are not connected to HIV affected communities, that they will think SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted through casual contact. This is a fear of mine, whether it plays out to be true or not, I don't know. So coming back now, moving from epidemiology to the social and cultural differences. Um, and I think this is the, the productive place where we can see similarities, but also, again, many more differences. So thinking with uh, scholar, sexuality studies scholar, Gail Rubin, um, if we think about the sex act as a, a behavior or an act that is over signified, means that it's always over determined, right? There's always meaning and value attached to sex, which is the primary transmitter of HIV, unlike SARS CoV 2, where the transmission is through breathing. Right? We, we don't over signify breathing, it's pretty quotidian, or else we'd all be dead. Um, so, just so that we have a clarity about the, the differences between the over signification of the act that transmits. COVID 19 also is not a plague. It is not a pestilence as there's no overarching moral condemnation of people who test positive. Whereas AIDS was God's punishment, right? This is what the sort of religious fundamentalist response was. With COVID-19, the religious fundamentalists, since they are directly affected, uh, don't believe it exists right? Um, so there is no moral condemnation in the same way that AIDS was uh, your own fault for engaging in risky behavior. This also eliminates in some ways the conversation of innocent victim versus the people who deserved it, right? And this all comes back to the over-signified act of sex being the, the root of transmission. Also looking at the sort of social conditions under which COVID-19 takes place, the government response is completely different. Whereas with HIV and AIDS, nothing was said, nothing was done. It was a joke. It was only faggots who were dying, so who cares? Uh, the government response with COVID-19, while we may have critiques of it as woefully insufficient, 
Um, there were lockdowns, nationwide income replacement programs, state investment in PPE production, wage subsidies, rent subsidies. And again, while we might find these things insufficient, nothing, nothing was done in response to the AIDS crisis without the demands of activists doing everything. For example, there was no national AIDS strategy in Canada until AIDS Action Now pushed for it in 1998. Right? So we're talking about a virus that starts spreading significantly in 1981. And so there's no national strategy until 1998. Um, also from the images uh, that you see on this slide deck, quarantine plays out very differently between COVID-19 and the AIDS crisis, uh, right? Where COVID-19, we have self-quarantining, uh, isolation and lockdown for the betterment of all of society. Whereas with HIV and during the AIDS crisis, we saw tabled legislation in British Columbia and Nova Scotia, so under the Social Credit Party and the Tories, uh, actual AIDS quarantine policies put on the table. In Ontario, where I imagine a lot of people are, um, the, the approach to quarantine was using Section 22 of the Ontario Health Act. Um, which was also indeed the same uh, section 22 that was used during COVID-19. So we can see a link between past and present with quarantine in Ontario. I also want to spend just a, a, another one minute on, on the social and cultural differences to think about race-based data for HIV versus COVID-19. Um, and I, I imagine a lot of people don't know this unless you work in the field. There is no race-based data for HIV in Quebec. In Saskatchewan, race-based data is only collected as indigenous or non-indigenous. In Ontario, before 2009, there's no race-based data for HIV. And British Columbia stopped reporting race-based data in 2016 and removed all past race-based data for HIV. So when you see data and statistics about HIV in Canada, we know that it's mostly a guess. And when we don't have good data, we cannot or it's more difficult to make demands that resources be distributed to the communities that are most affected. Race-based data for HIV that is collected is collected at point of testing. Race-based data for SARS-CoV-2 is not collected at the point of testing, but is deduced by postal code of where people have tested positive against 2016 census data. So this is a very different approach to race-based data between the two epidemics. Um, in both cases, they are somewhat educated guesses. A few other things to note about race-based data and COVID-19 is that the World Health Organization introduces the language of social determinants of health. Um, so similar to the language of syndemics that, that um, Ronaldo was speaking to in 2005. So I'm not as familiar with the critiques, critiques of syndemics and social determinants of health but I do understand that 
these have allowed us to not think of people as um, biological problems, but as um, social, socially compounded forces that are the problem, right? So poverty is a driving factor of most illness, uh, for example. And under racialized capitalism, we understand poverty to be um, racialized. Um, so with this language of social determinants of health, the vaccine rollout in Canada um, was to First Nations and Northern communities first, and then the rollout to hotspot communities, which were largely based in these zip uh, postal codes that were um, racialized communities. This is a very different approach that ha than what happened with HIV and AIDS. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really close to time, so I'm gonna just try to pop through a few things quickly without annoying the ASL interpreters. Um, the last sort of race-based uh, question I, I think that is interesting for us to think about is that Immigration Refugee Citizenship Canada is rolling out new immigration programs as we speak to increase immigration during the pandemic while well, HIV positive people are still banned from immigrating to Canada as economic immigrants. Um, the liberals say they're gonna temporarily change this, but they're liars and I don't believe them. So we'll see. Um, but this is an important, a very different situation. We live in a very different world. Um, also most urban centers in Canada are, or most of the major urban centers in Canada are majority people of color. That wasn't true in 1981 when the virus starts. Uh, you know, Canada looks like a very different place. It was 95% white in 1981 and it's 73% white today. So again, the, the, the social conditions of what happens with the virus are very different. So I'm really gonna quickly do my last two slides and then I'm going to stop. I'm sorry, Ricky, I know I'm like a minute over. Um, Quickly to say, who, who is making the, the comparisons? Um, it was an early framing device for people to try to understand the crisis uh, with COVID. And Ricky's noted this in his introduction. Um, but I, one of the things I was thinking about is perhaps my frustration and my annoyance is actually about the company I keep, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and a lot of those, a lot that company tends to be um, boomer and older Gen X queers um, who experienced the AIDS crisis firsthand um, and are often the ones that were making the comparison. Um, because importantly, I want to note that most people don't compare anything to AIDS because most people don't know anything about AIDS. <laughs> um, to be to be strictly saying. Uh, yeah, most people don't know or don't care. Um, so Susan Sontag, Paula Treichler, they're really helpful for me thinking about these questions of how this comparison is made, how we search for meaning. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm really just gonna show my last slide. Even though I think there are distinct and dissimilar viruses and diseases, there's things that we can learn from social movement history. Uh, Ronaldo already mentioned Derek, Gary Kinsman, a uh, colleague of mine at the AIDS Activist History Project. I think there's lots of things we can learn from the activist response to the AIDS crisis. I just don't think the comparison between the epidemics is useful um, or helpful and also might be dangerous. Um, and lastly, I'll just mention Dr. Tesla Jones, who uh, also is thinking about these questions um, not just about comparing COVID-19 to HIV, but thinking about um, pandemics more broadly, which I, which I actually think is, is very important and what we should be doing. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop uh, so I can stop uh, going over time. Um, excellent. Um, um, how do you know? Thanks a lot for that thought, Ryan. Um, it was very interesting. And I'm really um, moved by the, the, the honesty in both of your presentations. I think it has brought up uh, a lot of interesting um, 
complexities that it comes to thinking about uh, sort of this present pandemic and the ways in which people have but a bit sense of it. Um, I suppose I have a question, and this is for both of you. Um, you know that um, the comparisons are being made, and you know, um, and you know, at the end of the day, for me, this whole series is not just a, a series about comparing HIV and COVID. I want to make that very clear. It's just a, a series about sex, sexuality, uh, intimacy, um, uh, and how these things become informed by different kinds of health crises, whether it's HIV or COVID. Uh, so I want it to be very clear that this is not a series about just the distinction between HIV and COVID-19. Um, uh, that being said, we, we know that this comparison is being made. And I think Ryan pointed out uh, some, some interesting kind of observations about how these comparisons are coming up and what these comparisons look like. But I guess I have a question about why this is, these comparisons are being made. What, what, what's motivating them? What is it? Uh, what is it that moving? Whoever is making these comparisons to make these comparisons. Um, that, however we feel about them, if I'm very much on the fence, I, I don't often think that the comparisons are accurate. I don't often think that the comparisons make sense. But I am of the opinion that the comparisons are being made, and I want to understand more as to what kinds of sight pit or affective or emotional or sociological or political reasons there are as to why these comparisons are actually happening. So um, yeah, that's my question. Why, 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 why this? desire on the part of some folks to kind of make these comparisons. Do you want to go first, Ryan, or should I? Okay. I think, Ricky, that's a really good question. And part of, part of what I'm trying to work through in this paper and in the Topia piece where I conjoined these two things is to, is to think about the state. That for me is at the conjuncture of the state where the most useful kind of comparisons lie. So in one sense, you can say in the initial moment of HIV, the state recedes and disappears. And therefore the state becomes a site of struggle and a site of, for making both moral, ethical and political claims. In the moment of COVID, the state does not recede, but the state becomes overly vigilant, but it provides the same kind of demand around moral, ethical, and political claims. And so it is the question of thinking about the state and how the state responded to populations both prior to the eventful moment of AIDS or COVID and in the midst of the eventful moment. So in the event, prior to the eventful moment of COVID, the state had abandoned many of us. In the midst of COVID, the state now seeks to handle many of us. Prior to the eventful moment of HIV and AIDS, the state had in many ways 
abandoned, but was also in the process of, in some ways, reckoning with at least white queer people and white gay men. Then HIV happens and the state abandons them yet again. And so the state becomes a site of organizing, of moral claim, of ethical demand, and so on. Where the argument that I just made begins to fray is when you turn that onto Black populations, onto Black gay men, onto Black people in COVID, you see how the state works very differently um, for Black people. So, you know, here I'm talking to you and on my desk is Sarah Shulman's Let the Record Show. And of course, we know that uh, up until now, many of the official histories of HIV and its organizing had jettisoned Black queer people. And, um, and we know that Black gay men in the first instances of HIV died in tremendously large numbers. And we now see in the first instances of COVID that Black people are also dying in large numbers. And the thing that joins those two kinds of deaths together for me is the question of the modern state and the place of black people to go to the phrase that I used um, that I borrowed from Ruth Wilson Gilmore, the, way, the manner in which the state continues to abandon black people. And I think it's noticing those kinds of things that are producing some of the comparisons and, are, and therefore the, the comparisons are really rooted for me in the sense of how do we confront the state to get the state, for lack of better language, to do the right thing. That even with a state in COVID that is overreaching, it is still not doing the right thing for Black people. So we continue to die. And so my prediction is that much like HIV, which is now an epidemic for Black populations, wherever they are, that COVID, will remain an epidemic for black populations wherever they are. Much like HIV, where white gay men and others see the end of HIV, right? Um, the Ontario, the OHTN, I can never get their, their acronym right, but the OHTN runs a conference called Endgame in which they can envision the end of HIV, largely for white people, because the same OHTN knows that in Ontario, um, the numbers for black people continue to be fairly steady, but they can imagine an end game. And we can see a similar kind of thing happening with COVID. And so it's, the, it's, the, it's this, so I'm going on, I'm repeating myself, so I shut up, but it's the question of the state and the role that the state plays is so fundamentally important to why the comparisons have emerged, I think. Yeah, and I, I want to build a little bit off of um, what Ronaldo said around structural abandonment, um, because I do think that's a useful place for thinking through some of these um, comparisons. Um, one being, right, the, the income replacement programs, the CERB, uh, for example, um, this was of no help to sex workers or anyone else who works in marginal economies where their, their, their income is not accounted for by the state, right? So all of these people become ineligible uh, for income replacement programs, despite this, you know, large government response, right? It's a generous government response, but it will largely goes to middle-class people and upper income people, <laughs> um, which, right, if we also look at things like ODSP or other social welfare programs that the income replacement programs were better and worth more than what disabled people or working poor people already have access to, right? Um, so there's these questions of structural abandonment and uh, in terms of you know, why HIV remains within specific groups of people, why COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 might remain within specific groups of people um, in, in part is because there's no national pharmacare system in Canada, 
right? So this is a question of resources, economics, and class um, under racialized capitalism, right? So uh, if people don't have access to things like medicine, of course, that's where disease is going to stay. Um, two, uh, it, it's funny to bring up uh, ACT UP and Sarah's new book, which I'm excited to read, but I'm also, I guess I don't care about New York, <laughs> to put it frankly. Um, and the history of New York and the history of AIDS activism in New York becomes the history of AIDS activism in America or in North America. Um, and I think that's troubling. And the height of the HIV COVID-19 comparison in my experience was when New York City was going through their major first wave. Um, so there was lots of people talking about the AIDS crisis, the event of AIDS and HIV. Um, and that is just not, not where I live. That's not, not my experience in the Ottawa Valley and Udaway and Gatineau. Like uh, it's a different place. We have a different history. There's different people here. Um, so there, there becomes this national story and national comparison, but it's actually specific groups of people in specific places making the comparison. And thirdly, to sort of reflect and, and what I had hoped to get in my talk, but I didn't, is that I'm, I'm as interested in the question of why we are not comparing COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 to things like Ebola and MERS and the SARS outbreak in 2013, avian flu, swine flu, H1N1, right? I am as interested in why those comparisons are not happening as much as I am interested in why the comparison to HIV is happening. Um, and I mean, my answer to that <laughs> is racism and xenophobia, right? They're happening elsewhere um, where, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is happening here, HIV happened here. Um, we still have these origin stories about coming from, you know, Asia or Africa, but not from here. Um, but I, I do think, um, the asking about the absence of comparison is as interesting to me as asking why the comparison to HIV in particular is happening. Um, and yeah, again, I think that's because of racism and xenophobia. It's uh, interesting that, you know, as much as there is this comparison around HIV and COVID and how it's become a part of public discourse uh, and clear discourse, what's also been interesting is that there are other kinds of comparisons also being made. I remember when COVID was first starting to make its appearance in North America, a lot of people were using the metaphor of war, that we are at war, this is at war time, you know? And what I found fascinating was that oftentimes the people who were making these references were people, mostly you know, older, white, privileged people for whom they never experienced war on our souls. There's never been, you know, uh, an invasion here, except the invasion of colonial imperial invasion that, <laughs> that you know, upended lives here. And so, you know, I it's it's interesting to me the way that metaphors certainly in this moment. Um, we have a couple of questions in the in the in the chat. I'm going to have Ali read some of these questions out. Um, sure. And that can sort of help us with uh, the conversation. Ali. Hi. So we have two questions that are pretty related, um, I think. So I'll just combine them. Um, so Ahmed would like to hear more about how HIV became associated with Haiti in Africa. Um, Ke'ekuro says, um, I appreciated Ronaldo starting with AIDS as Haiti and Africa, and I'm wondering if part of the transformation of COVID-19 from biological to social is its relocation to Africa, especially given the vaccine in North America and the very poor access to vaccines in many parts of Africa. 
Um, I mean, there's a part of the, the larger paper where I recount from what I still think is uh, one of the most important books ever written on HIV AIDS, um, which is Cindy Patton's Inventing AIDS. And of course, Cindy Patton does something that I think is often not commented on when people discuss her book, but what she does, and I, I may even read you that, that paragraph, but what, what, she, what she does is that I think is really crucial is that she gets at the assumption that scientists made about where AIDS could have come from. And she's really clear that the scientists immediately assumed that AIDS could not have come from anywhere in North America or, or Europe. So they had to go find it, right? So she wrote, let me read you the, the little couple of sentences she said. She writes, when the West found itself beset by a deadly little virus of unknown origin, it sought the source elsewhere. Nothing of this sort, it argued, could have arisen in the germ-free West. So the best research minds of the Western world set off on a fantastic voyage in search of the source of AIDS. They went to Haiti and Zaire because the first non-European cases were diagnosed in people from those countries, <laughs> right? What, what that doesn't do is, as Patton points out is, it doesn't tell you that those people necessarily contracted the virus in those countries. All that tells you is that they were from those countries. And so, you know, that's the, that's the, you know, the question of how we even understand the biological and how we trace it epidemiologically, um, how we trace it in science is also already laden with a cultural story that only particular parts of the globe are already polluted, unhygienic, and are the birthplaces of all that might trouble us. And so I think that the question, the question around, you know, the vaccine hoarding in North America and COVID um, becoming um, becoming a kind of social, the social life of COVID transforming as Africa is much more further impacted. It's, it's one, that, it's an interesting one. I'm not, I'm not sure that COVID is not already um, wrapped up and involved in a particular kind of social life. And so for me, the question is, how do we think about how Africa will become this kind of avatar that repeats the history of the unhygienic. Because I think that as the vaccine hoarding continues apace and as Africa potentially becomes more susceptible to the virus and its various variants with no access to adequate vaccination, that the story will not be the story of the virus, but the story would be the history of an, of an assumed Africa that's an unhygienic place, a place that lacks um, the kind of ability to, um, to be non-polluting. So that what leaves is the question of global capitalism and how global capitalism impacts and frames illness. And what, what remains is the kind of long story that led Western scientists to go searching in Africa for the HIV virus, um, which is that history of pollution, unhygienic, un lack of hygiene and so on. So I'll stop there. I have just a couple of short, short comments. Um, one, uh, the, the film by John Grayson, Zero Patients, um, does try to trouble this understanding of where epidemics and, and the origins of illness come from, um, you know, the, the, particularly attacking the like African green monkey theory, which was one of these early 
AIDS comes from, you know, these Africans having sex with monkeys, uh, stereotypes or tropes that was circulating quite widely. Um, so John Grayson's film uh, does address that particular, um, yeah, trope directly. Um, in terms of this question of thinking about Haiti uh, in particular, um, Karma Chavez in her, her book, Queer Migration Politics, um, begins to take up this question, right, about thinking about how and why were Haitians so disproportionately impacted by HIV uh, at, the, at the onset of the event of AIDS in the West. Um, she, she tackles it in the introduction to her book, and I know she has a larger project where she's, she's looking at HIV and, and Haiti, um, but that would be a place to start and to keep an eye on her work. I know there's others who have published on it. Um, and if you have um, the energy for a read that is deeply epidemiological, um, Jacques Pepin's The Origins of AIDS um, is a deeply epidemiological book looking at the genetic diversity of the virus across the globe. Um, but there is, he does make interesting assessments about the social conditions of HIV in the Democratic Co Republic of Congo. Um, around industrialization, urbanization, and decolonization, um, and just the confluence of what was happening in the Democratic Republic of Congo and in Kinshasa um, in, in the 19-teens and 1920s, um, as you know, the, the spread of HIV on a global scale as a result of colonization. Um, and and that's, that's a fact that we need to contend with. Can I add something really quickly? I think what Ryan just said is really important, but I think that this is where, you know, thinking specifically about some time, about the social life of a virus and the way this, the narrative of that social life unfolds is like really important. So yeah, John's, John's um, patient zero, um, zero patients is, is a really amazing and wonderful send up and, and really intervenes at a particular time and place in the epidemic is really important. Um, but I think that look, there are two kinds of things that, that, that I'm thinking with here. One is that, for instance, if you've, if you've seen the movie of uh, the, the film uh, uh, made a couple of years ago about Gaetan Dugas, um, who was allegedly patient zero, right? Which, you know, and the film on, on does that as the typographical mistake that comes to be a zero, that wasn't a zero in the first instance and so on. But one of the things that that film does that's really interesting to me is, it talks about all the places that, that Gitan went as a flight attendant. And it absolutely does not mention any of his trips to Haiti or Africa. And, and, to, and to West Africa, both places that he went. And, and I take that little tidbit from that film and then I put it together with Paul Freeman's work on AIDS and, AIDS and accusation. And I think about the moment in Paul, in Paul Farmer's work where Paul Farmer is kind of making this really interesting case that part of what happened in, around AIDS in Haiti is that it's more likely that white gay men doing, doing um, sex tourism carried the virus to Haiti than the other way around, <laughs> uh, right? So you put that together with the way in which the attempt to then rescue Degas is to not mention um, any of his trips to Haiti or, or to Africa. And we see it very slowly interesting rewriting of white gay men and the history of HIV AIDS and particularly the history, the history of AIDS. And that was in part why I kind of invoke Sarah's book, not so much about centering New York because for me, the story of AIDS begins with the claim of what they, about the, the, the racist claims and the violent claims that get made against Haitians in Miami. <laughs> not New York, not San Francisco, AIDS in my head begins when I start seeing reports of people wanting to basically lynch Haitians because they were carrying the scary disease. But, but what's interesting to me is that, and, and, the, and going back to why I invoke Sarah's book is 
is the multiracial character of the organizing. And I, I think that Gary, Gary Kingsman had a question around solidarity and so on. And I think, you know, that question around solidarity is, I think Gary's right, we can use that question or that organizing um, to think about organizing around COVID. But again, we have to be really cautious because as we know with HIV that the organizing clearly benefited, and I think Ryan pointed to this, benefited white gay men. And this is why it continues to be an epidemic among black people. So Sarah's new book is helping us to think about many of the pitfalls that happened in that vast multiracial organizing in New York um, and what it might mean for our present. And it's a cautionary tale, uh, which is not to say that we don't build these kinds of multiracial coalitions to intervene into the state, to intervene into big pharma, to intervene into public health and so on. But we also can't do them now knowing fully well that public health and epidemiology um, are practices, forms of knowledge that are also fundamentally located in forms of anti-Black racism where Black people somehow always come out at the end as the fundamental problem of the problem. <laughs> okay, um, if it's okay, I'll, I'll start with another question. Uh, this one's in the Q&A from Mark Lipton. Uh, despite weak attempts to compare COVID with HIV AIDS, I want to ask about the clothing, closing of baths as reactionary politic, as well how might current uh, underground sex activities of young gay men differ from my promiscuous hooking up during the height of the HIV AIDS pandemic? I can go first this time. I just have a fan that I need to turn on and off because I'm really, really overheated in my tiny office. Um, maybe the, I don't have a lot to say about the, the closing of bathhouses, but I do want to think about the closing of commercial sexual spaces. Um, and so again, thinking about the structural abandonment or the, the, the state's um, making life more difficult under the guise of making things better, um, right? Sex workers, people who are dancers and strippers had their places of work closed first and longest, um, right? Because they were perceived as uh, sites of contagion, right? Um, so I can't speak to, I mean, <laughs> if you wanna talk about Ottawa bathhouse culture, non-existent where, where I live. Um, so it's not something I think about uh, too often, but um, yeah, I, I, I think about commercial sexual spaces and, and what does it mean for the people whose livelihoods are organized around um, spaces where trans monetary transactions happen around sex. Um, and I think that's something that, uh, you know, has been in the news a little bit, but I don't think people have taken it seriously. Um, and it again comes back to questions of um, people's ability to access things like the CERB when you, you work in semi above board or underground economies. Ronaldo? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think Mark Lipton's question is a really interesting one. Of course, the, the sense that there was a, a, a very clearly demarcated population that had to be intervened upon um, to interrupt HIV transmission um, helped to spectacularize the bathhouse. But the counterbalance to that was that, you know, late 80s, early 1990s, gay men are also in a struggle to not have their sex and sexuality stolen. And that's why I come to this idea after Ricky's invitation of the need for thinking about the theory of the prophylactic, because the condom offered us a kind of freedom, right? Um, this is the moment where 
we develop these slogans, come on me, not in me, right? All of these, so there was a real attempt to think through and, and act against the potential theft of black gay men, black, black, sorry, gay men. See, I only think about black gay men. That is how narcissistic I am. So I apologize. Gay men, gay, gay, gay men sex practices. What I find interesting, Mark, is that in the moment of COVID, you suddenly had people like um, the director of public health in BC, you had um, communiques coming from the UK public health, encouraging straight people to practice things like, um, oh, sudden language under my house. Um, anyhow, glory holes, glory holes, yeah. So what you saw is that as opposed to trying to steal sexuality and sexual practice, they were trying to give people their sexuality and sexual practice by offering them avenues to engage to engage in sexual practice. And, 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 and again, that's like really a really important marked difference in how we think about these two pandemics. Because one is really taught of as stemming from something that we ultimately really shouldn't be doing. And the other is fundamentally understood as interrupting everything that we should be doing. And it is that space in between those two that I think is really deeply profound and that will really um, be come at a great cost if we collapse them into one. Having said that, I still think that there are some moments that are useful to think them together with because they help us to clarify the kinds of demands that we need to make on capitalist states. But they help us also to understand the unequal distribution of race, um, racist discourse and racist framings of how we live, how we live together on the globe. Um, and, and that's maybe something we can come back to the way in which racist discourses are still underpinning both pandemics in, in really interesting ways. I, I actually want to add to that also. And I'm actually really, really fascinated by um, this proposition uh, about coming to uh, a social theory about the social access. I mean, I had never thought about it in that sense, but I think that's actually quite interesting in so many different ways. But I also am fascinated by how language itself becomes a social access around how we thought about sex, you know, what kind of sex we thought about, what kinds of sex is imagined by the state. You know, then public health is providing opportunities or information about the earning sexuality in people. What they are imagining often is heterosexuality, white sex, um, sex between men and women, cisgendered men and women and able-bodied sex. And so, you know, it's, it's interesting to kind of really think about what it means for a state to have normative understandings around what sex looks like in, in its fantasy. Um, the, the sex is, the, the, the sex is not really able to imagine black sex or brown sex or indigenous sex or disabled sex or sex that it appears. Um, 
or even let non normative forms of sexual encounters and orgies and whatnot, or even underground sexual cultures. And so, you know, then kind of wrap up this point, I, I'm really interested in how language itself becomes a, a way in which uh, ideas become revised and then sex is reimagined uh, by the state and normative ideas around sex become uh, disseminated or, or, or talked about. Um, but I think we have more questions, so I think we let Ali. Hi. Um, I see that Kasha has had their hand up for a while. Um, I'm going to allow you to talk, but if you prefer, if this was a hand up and mistake, no worries. So you can unmute yourself if you'd like and ask a question. Okay. Um, then I'm going to go on to the next question. Uh, I think that we have one. Also, oh yeah, Daniel Spada has their hand up as well. So I'm going to allow you to talk. I'm going to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. Okay. Um, so we'll go to another question then. Um, so we have one, I guess, I think that the question from Gary Kinsman was already sort of talked about, but would people like to address it more? Um, my question relates to the social life of two very different viruses and even epidemiological knowledge is always socially constructed. My focus is on learning from the activist response to AIDS and how this allows us to be more critical of racist and oppressive public health, pharmaceutical corporations, opposition to any group of people being designated as expendable, the need for social solidarity and mutual aid, the need for community-based safe practices and not imposed by public health and the police and more. Any comments on this would be appreciated. Um, Gary and I work together a lot <laughs> um, uh, as, as uh, co-conveners of the AIDS Activist History Project. Um, so I, I don't have a lot to add to, to, to what Gary has said. I'm, I'm in agreement. I think there's lots to learn uh, from AIDS Activist Social Movement History. Um, I, I would encourage people to engage with the AIDS Activist History Project. It's like more than 3,000 pages of oral histories um, from Canada specifically um, as, as a useful place to think about what can be learned from prior social movements. Um, and I, I guess I just wanna be clear in my critique of the comparison between HIV and AIDS, I'm not saying throw it all out. I'm saying we should be a lot more cautious and careful and considered when we are thinking about HIV and COVID together. And that where the usefulness is, is thinking about the history of the social movement to fight HIV and AIDS. Um, so I, I guess I just wanna be really clear about that, that like I, I find the comparison the sloppy and annoying um, and I am annoyed talking about it but I, I find the social movement history really useful and generative and helpful for thinking about how to respond to the crisis that we're in currently. Um, and, and the last thing I'll say is to, for us to be careful about, I, I mean, we've been, talk, been talking about the event of the AIDS crisis and, and just being careful and thinking through, like the AIDS crisis is ongoing, HIV is ongoing, um, the, the, the terrain of the, the epidemic is different today um, with sort of epidemiological interventions and social interventions, but um, to, to not relegate the social movement history of AIDS completely to the past um, and to, to allow for it to be ongoing and present. Um, and, and there's a lot of things about the current AIDS moment that there's, 
much to be critical of, right? The hyper-professionalization of aid service organizations um, that we, we can use as a cautionary tale for thinking about um, other public health programs that might come out of the COVID crisis that then turn into, you know, six-figure salaries for bureaucrats, but I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I, 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 I think Ryan, you just said something that's really important. And again, I, I just, this is just a, like a, a really tiny addendum, but I think it's an important one that even as we see, you know, the HIV AIDS service and medical um, complex become a part of the normative um, routines of um, gay and queer culture. Even within that, we see all of these disjunctive and on the edge of abandonment practices as well. So that, you know, what white gay men are able to access, Asian and East Asian men are not, and Black men are not. And, you know, even as we watch that complex um, produce white men as experts, which gave us the language of syndemics, which, you know, some people would even argue that syndemics is not just intersectionality like, but it's actually a kind of plagiarism of intersectionality, where it just pulled the questions of race out and then repopulated, repopulated it in, 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 in a series of, of ways. Um, but like, you know, at the very local level in, in a city like Toronto, we can see within the HIV AIDS complex, the tremendous disparities. You know, some of us know from anecdotal evidence um, because we live in communities that young black men in Toronto sometimes still die from full-blown AIDS, right? And when we know that, that tells us a story not just about what HIV AIDS services are not able to extend to black life, but it even tells us a story about what constitutes universal health care in Canada and all of these and all of these kinds of social indices, indices that syndemic and the social determinants of health were supposed to be the language to intervene in and to produce different material outcomes for people. Um, so, I mean, I guess I, I really want to stress that the language of public health, the idea of public health itself, the language of epidemiology is so fundamentally wrapped up in an originary anti-Blackness where Africa is this avatar of, 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 um, of unhygienic, polluted bodies, practices, cultures that we really need an entirely different account of how we think about infectious disease. If we are to um, be able to respond in a way that doesn't always drag along these histories of non-white bodies writ large as always already polluted. And, and, and of course, you know, in that logic is that uh, the West, the white West, never takes anything anywhere. It brings it back. It always encounters it and brings it back, uh, but it never takes anything anyway. But of course, we know entirely, this to be entirely different historically, Ricky invoked the invasion of colonization. We know how um, white colonists knew disease and illness and epidemics to wipe out indigenous communities and so on. So there's a way in which public health and epidemiology has the story of infection backwards. <laughs> and so the story of epidemiology is a white excuse to not engage with its legacy of violent infection. And one last thing I, I would, this, I mean, it's a, t a bit of a tangent, but I, I think it builds well on this. Um, as a cautionary tale for sexuality studies as this interdisciplinary field that has, you know, more and more actual departments emerging, is that sexuality studies as it becomes, quote unquote, useful within the neoliberal university, 
is in the management of other people's bodies and lives, right? So sexuality studies is in the service of social work or is in the service of public health. Um, and I think Ronaldo, Ricky, myself, and other people take a very different approach to this amorphous field of sexuality studies that is saying the promise of sexuality studies is actually more than managing other people's lives in the name of the state. Um, and so I just wanted to share that because I'm, I've been thinking about that a lot lately of like, what is my relationship to this field when more and more of this field is about managing people's bodies and lives in ways that I find repulsive and I don't want anything to do with. Um, and so I, I think that feeds into this question of public health, epidemiology, um, and the way that we frame um, viruses. It's even our education uh, in, in higher ed around sexuality studies is in service of that same goal. Um, and I resist it, others resist it, of course, but it, it is there and I feel it and I feel that push. Okay, I think we have time for probably one last question. So I'm gonna go to one that was in the chat a while back um, from John Rico saying, how can we factor China and anti-Chinese politics into this geopolitical history? And how to think about China and Africa to the fastest growing populations in relation to white supremacist myths of the great replacement? I mean, I, that's, a, that's a great question, John. And in, in some ways, I'll, I'll begin where I just ended, which is to say that the kind of logic of these, these epidemics and pandemics and viruses and infections ha often have the, sto the story backwards. So it, they're often understood as coming from these non-white places that are unhygienic, polluted, um, degraded um, bodies that are incapable of having any kind of integrity in relationship to quote unquote, keeping out bad things. And then they pollute the rest of the world, meaning the rest of the white world. And of course we know the history of hygiene and the history of, of disease is actually different from that. <laughs> That we know, in fact, it's been, it has been Europe that has often spread um, disease around, around the world. And of course, you know, again, repeating myself, but you know, a lot of our modern epidemiology has been to trace some of the most, um, some of the most difficult illnesses to these non-white places back to China, back to Africa as, as the site and source of the initial origin. And once that happens, what sets in is that social history. And I mean, a lot of Trump's rhetoric in the eventful moment of COVID was really referencing that kind of history, which is to say that it was indeed marking China as an unhygienic place. But it was also, I think, John, covering the story of China as the US great imperial competitor now. So on the writing much of this, yes, it's definitely the narrative of the great displacement. And so we know that two things have happened. Vaccine hoarding means that there are less vaccines for the African continent. And we also know that simultaneously vaccine hoarding in the West, there has been a lot of propaganda and discourse that the Chinese vaccine also doesn't work, right? So when you put those two things together, you begin to see how a kind of reconstituted global white supremacy is playing itself out through some of the rhetorics in relationship to to COVID-19 and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, but that's a really good question. I got to think about it some more. That's some of my initial thoughts. Yeah, and I just really quickly will say, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that the Combating Human Trafficking Act, Bill 251 was introduced in parliament a few months ago or a month ago uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic 
Um, we know this is an expansion of police powers and surveillance powers that are gonna disproportionately affect Asian women in particular and black women in particular. Um, and for folks that don't know, you know, th this bill is, is, is a joke, it's heinous, and it will allow for warrantless searches of any premise where, you know, Asian women and black women are supposedly working um, in the sex trade. Um, so again, that's not a, there's lots to think about in your question, John, but I, I think it's helpful to be thinking in parallel. Um, Anti-Asian racism isn't new. It's just, you know, another iteration of an old problem um, within the conception of the Canadian state. Um, and yeah, for, for folks that don't know about Bill 251, I encourage you to, to look into the Combating Human Trafficking Act um, because it's, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's a really horrible law and it's happening during COVID. Um, I just want to actually, you know, the uh, almost at the end of this, uh, this first panel, um, I just want to, it, it, opportunity to uh, and, and Ronaldo and Ryan for coming out and presenting their, their amazing art. I, I found it very productive and very generative and I hope the audience did also. I also want to thank everyone who came out um, in the audience um, this events like this um, as much about the audience participation as it is about the speakers. So I'm really happy for everyone who showed up and I hope it was generative for everyone. Um, I also want to thank uh, my, uh, with my school, so Disability Studies Esther Ignatly for her ongoing support of my work and my colleagues, um, all of them at the School of Social of the disability studies and the faculty's community services. I also want to thank um, uh, Emma and Cindy, the ASL interpreters, and Luke who helped us with that, and Angie Lamb, who helped us with the caption. Um, and I especially want to offer a word of thanks to my research assistant, Dali, the outcome this would be virtually impossible. Um, so the next uh, event is on uh, Friday, June 18th uh, at 1.30 p.m. Uh, I hope you all can make it out for that. Um, you can register for the event at the same place that you registered for this event, www.sexinthepandemic.com. Um, and I hope that this was the first exciting event to inaugurate this uh, series. Uh, and thanks a lot for coming out. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks all. Bye.